Hello. Do you know what this is? It's another lightsaber giveaway! We are doing a brand new lightsaber giveaway for 90,000 subscribers. Own a Saber is sponsoring our giveaway. They've been kind enough to give away three different lightsabers to three different winners. There will be three tiers, a Padawan winner, a Master winner, and a Replica winner. These are some super high quality lightsabers and you gotta make sure you get in on the action. So go down below and check out the Google link to sign up. All you have to do is fill in the information and you'll be entered into the giveaway. Of course, if you want to skip the line and get your very own lightsaber, go to Onus Saber and check out some of their quality lightsabers. They're running a 30% discount on some of their newest additions. Thank you, Onus Saber, for sponsoring our 90,000 subscriber lightsaber giveaway. Can't wait to see you at the end. Our story begins inside of the Invisible Hand. The ship rattled back and forth as a battle smashed the exterior of the vessel. Anakin and Dooku were interlocked in a duel on the other side of the tower. Obi-Wan's eyes flickered open. He moved a little bit but realized that he was trapped. Where was he? What had happened? The sound of the lightsaber duel was fading in and out of his mind. He could hear it, but it felt so distant. Obi-Wan's eyes shot open a little bit more briefly, and he assessed that he was trapped. He wiggled his feet to make sure he hadn't lost the ability to walk. He could feel his feet, but the blood circulation was not exactly circulating. Obi-Wan pushed his hands under the walkway and lifted it up ever so slightly. He was really fuzzy, and the sounds were still echoey. He turned his head to see if he could spot Anakin and Dooku, but that was cut short when he heard the sizzling sound of skin and the ignition of another lightsaber. Obi-Wan knew that someone had just lost a fight, and he had to make sure it wasn't Anakin. Obi-Wan pulled his other foot out from under the walkway and got to his feet, before falling off of them. He stumbled to the ground and he heard something that set the chill down his spine. He could hear Palpatine praising Anakin. The chill he felt when he first heard Palpatine was nothing in comparison to the sound he heard afterwards, which was Palpatine telling Anakin to kill the Sith Lord. That wasn't good. Obi-Wan ran around the corner and he saw Anakin standing there with two lightsabers sitting across each other and in front of him, a defeated Dooku. It took a couple seconds for Obi-Wan to register that Dooku had lost his hands. Obi-Wan yelled at Anakin and told him to stop. It was just as Anakin was telling Palpatine that he shouldn't do it. Before Anakin could react to Obi-Wan, Obi-Wan heard Palpatine tell him to do it. Anakin didn't move. His arms budged ever so slightly and his head turned over to see Obi-Wan, who was stumbling on his feet forward. He was a little loose on his feet due to the walkway being brought down on his legs. He reached out his hand and shook his head. Anakin looked back down at Dooku, who hadn't said a word. There was so much he could say, but he was at a loss for words. He felt just so betrayed by his master. Obi-Wan slowly walked up to Anakin, whose hands were unsteady. A war can take so much from someone, but it was clear that despite the thousands of battle droids Anakin destroyed, he still had some semblance of humanity left within him. He may have disliked Dooku, maybe even hated him, but he didn't want to do this. Obi-Wan came up to Anakin and told him that there were other ways to handle this. They did not need to kill him. Anakin nodded his head and slowly moved his hands back away from him. While Anakin may have not heard Palpatine telling him to kill Dooku by saying, do it, Obi-Wan did. Kenobi grabbed Dooku's blade from Anakin's hand and put it on his belt. He walked around Anakin and looked at Palpatine and told him that Anakin should not be instructed to follow such orders. It was inhumane from Palpatine, and as a politician, maybe he should learn some humanity. This may have been a bit personal coming from Kenobi. The woman he loved was a duchess who loved her people and gave her life for them. This wasn't saying that Palpatine should do the same for the Republic, but Kenobi had to admit he didn't expect Palpatine to stoop so low. Obi-Wan wanted to consult the council about this erratic behavior. It didn't seem like something just a regular old man would say. It was cynical. Obi-Wan used the force to break the locks around Palpatine's wrists. He said that Anakin was very powerful and very wise, but he shouldn't be coerced into doing something that was clearly wrong and something that he knew was wrong. Maybe Obi-Wan didn't want Dooku to die because Dooku was Qui-Gon's mentor, or maybe it was the most blatant answer ever that just killing Dooku could make it harder for the Jedi to understand who the real Sith Lord was, as well as stopping the Separatist efforts by forcing them to surrender. Obi-Wan walked over to Dooku and put his hand under his arm and helped him to his feet. Kenobi looked over to Anakin and asked if he was alright. Skywalker nodded his head, and Obi-Wan suggested they get on the move. There was no point to be waiting around. Dooku was still very quiet, like his tongue had been removed. Palpatine walked with them, and they carried on through the ship until they were hit with a ray shield and trapped inside. This was the first that Dooku spoke. He said to the Jedi that Grievous would come for them. Anakin looked over at the Count and told him that they would destroy General Grievous. It wouldn't be a problem for them. Obi-Wan looked around and Anakin suggested that in a moment R2 would release the ray shields. This was true, however, R2 was not able to release the ray shields. As the group made their way for the bridge of the Invisible Hand, they were greeted by General Grievous. Dooku was walking with the other droids and standing in a ghostly fashion. His skin was pale and his eyes wore nothing but defeat in them. Obi-Wan saw this and he was trying to get to the bottom of it. 
Obviously, Dooku and Palpatine were political rivals, but there was something else here. Dooku looked as if he'd been betrayed by a longtime friend, someone he would consider an ally. Dooku's face wore shock, sadness, and shame. Perhaps there was something more. Obi-Wan didn't have time to think about it because General Grievous and Anakin were getting snarky with each other. Anakin learned a lot from Obi-Wan, and while he may have never interacted with Grievous until now, he knew how to piss him off. He had a fragile ego and calling him short, even in his incredible height, annoyed Grievous. Didn't matter, the banter was nothing more than a distraction for R2 as he unloaded all the systems in the middle of the bridge as Kenobi and Skywalker ignited their lightsabers and broke out of their cufflings. Grievous backed away as Magna Guards ignited their staffs and a number of B1s took Palpatine away. Kenobi and Skywalker quickly got to work, fighting off the droids. Dooku moved out of the way, which caught Grievous' attention. Why wasn't he fighting? The droid general didn't notice that Dooku was missing his hands. That was something he wouldn't figure out either. Obi-Wan engaged a Magna Guard while Anakin cut down the B1s holding the Chancellor captive. Obi-Wan was able to get around to Grievous before Anakin could corner him. Grievous assumed that this was some sort of test by Dooku, like Dooku wanted to see Grievous defeat both the Jedi, and so instead of running away he gutted his two lightsabers just in time to confront Skywalker. With the bridge emptying out, Dooku and Palpatine looked on in interest from different sides of the room. Skywalker moved in first. Grievous was able to make a number of quick parries before launching his attack on Skywalker and kicking him off his feet. Grievous whipped around engaging with Kenobi. Their duel kicked off with a speedy assault. Obi-Wan was on the defense as per usual. All their times fighting together across the war led them here, to this moment. With four lightsabers ignited, Obi-Wan quickly defended himself. He was able to catch Grievous in a bind and slip him. Under the slip, he cut off two of the hands before Grievous tried to challenge Obi-Wan again. A blue lightsaber exited through his back and through his chest. To ensure his death, Obi-Wan ran forward swinging, slicing, and dicing the good general. The fun wasn't over yet. The ship was breaking apart. The Republic had assumed that Kenobi and Skywalker had escaped and one of the flagships of the Republic fleet nearly destroyed the invisible hand. Anakin looked over at Obi-Wan and they nodded their heads. Kenobi pushed Dooku down into a seat and strapped him in because of the no hands thing. He made his way back to his seat and the ship dropped down out of space and the entire back half of the ship ripped apart. Anakin and Obi-Wan piloted the ship through the skies as fire patrols came to douse the fire, until they slammed down onto the runway, accidentally wiping out the air traffic control center and another happy landing. Obi-Wan told Anakin that he would take Dooku back to prison and asked that Anakin escort the Chancellor to the Senate building. Palpatine was not fond of this, as he believed that Dooku would tell information to the Jedi. He needed to make Kenobi understand why that wouldn't happen. Palpatine told Obi-Wan that Dooku was under Republic jurisdiction and he needed to be brought to the Republic military complex. Obi-Wan nodded his head and explained that that was exactly where Dooku was going to go. Of course, he was going to the Jedi Temple, but he wasn't here to oblige the Chancellor. This was setting Obi-Wan off even more. Why was Palpatine being so hostile towards the situation? There wasn't anything more between the two of them, was there? Dooku and Palpatine never, at least to Obi-Wan's knowledge, interacted with each other before Dooku became Count of Sereno. This was certainly something that needed to be dealt with and addressed to the Jedi Council. Anakin obviously didn't believe Obi-Wan was lying and he saw that this was working brilliantly in their favor. Dooku was caught and Grievous was destroyed. As the two parties split up with the assistance of LAAT dropships, Anakin and Palpatine would have a conversation, as would Dooku and Kenobi. Without clones in the back of the LAAT, Palpatine would tell Skywalker that he believed the Jedi didn't trust him. While Anakin had no real reason to see that as true, he also didn't have any real reason to see that as false. Palpatine suggested that the Jedi Council clearly did not trust him and they wanted him gone, hence why Master Kenobi was so standoffish. Anakin shook his head. He said that Obi-Wan wasn't being standoffish, he's just escorting the prisoner to prison. Why would Palpatine assume Obi-Wan would do any differently? In all honesty, this wasn't doing Palpatine any favors for Anakin. Anakin wasn't fond of just executing Dooku. He had his reasons for wanting to, but he was a Jedi. It wasn't something Jedi did. Anakin suggested that Obi-Wan was doing right by him by stopping him from killing Dooku. He had information they needed, and it could help resolve the war with him still alive. Palpatine, after this sentiment, became quiet in a brooding nature. Obi-Wan and Dooku, on the other hand, were surrounded by clones as they departed for the Jedi Temple. Obi-Wan told Dooku that he could inform him of who the Sith Lord was, and this could be all over and done with. Dooku looked at Kenobi with a scowl. He said he was disappointed. After three years of war and so many opportunities to see the truth, he didn't understand how Obi-Wan continuously missed it after it was told him on Genosis. It was staring him right in the face. Obi-Wan said it could be easier if he just told the Council who the Sith Lord was so the war could end. Obi-Wan didn't want any more clones to die. It was pointless. The war was over. It was time to surrender. Dooku simply shook his head. 
When they arrived, they were greeted by Masters Windu and Fisto. The clones stayed on the LAAT as Dooku and Kenobi exited. Windu turned around without saying a word, and they walked where Dooku would be questioned. The Jedi Council members on World were all waiting here for Dooku's arrival. They sauntered through the temple halls. Dooku's eyes didn't move. He looked straight forward without saying a word. There was an eerie feeling coming from within him. But the Council could also interpret this as some sort of fear. When they entered the questioning room, Dooku was seated and the Council members all looked at him. Yoda stepped forward and asked who the Sith Lord was, and Dooku looked around with a scowl again. He told them that he already told them. They had three years to try and save the fractured system that they curated for thousands of years. The Order had become complacent due to its Grand Master and there was nothing to save it except for what was to replace it. Dooku didn't say another word. In his mind, he knew where he sat. Dooku may have been shocked that Sidious would just turn on him so quickly. He may have been disappointed that he didn't see it coming sooner. But the reality is, Dooku believed the Jedi would fail. He wasn't on their side. He literally told Obi-Wan that the Sith controlled the Senate three years ago, and amid all potential coincidences there were throughout the Clone Wars, it shouldn't have been that far-fetched to assume that Palpatine was behind everything. Dooku didn't even want to see the Jedi win. He didn't want to see the Republic win. Why would he tell them? Did he feel for Kenobi? Sure. It was the last sign of Qui-Gon, because Dooku certainly did not like Skywalker, but if Obi-Wan would die a Jedi rather than on the winning side, then that too was his fault. He had his chance to change, and he didn't. Dooku was sticking to himself. When the Jedi fell, he could be free. Though in an ironic way, Dooku believed that with Grievous dead, the Jedi and Sidious would come to take each other out, and he could just come out on top. Sidious had other plans. He was assuming that the Jedi Order was going to learn what they needed from Dooku and turn on him. He wanted Skywalker on his side, and so he created a perfect way to do that. So while he and Anakin had a small disagreement in the LAAT, it did not fracture their relationship. Targeting Kenobi was clearly not the way to go, and because he knew that, he could target one of the other people in Anakin's life. That person was probably the most important person in Anakin's life, and he'd make short work of her. It would be so easy. Palpatine designed the inhibitor chips to have a primary function, and that was to make his victory as easy as possible. It would have to wait, though. Palpatine told Skywalker that he was to be his personal representative on the Jedi High Council. Anakin was taken aback, and his excitement grew. He would become a master. This on top of the fact that he was going to be a father was super exciting to him. What more could he ask for? When Anakin returned to the Jedi Temple, he learned that Dooku wasn't actually at the Republic military complex, which did surprise him. But he learned that the Jedi were on edge. See, while he was with the Chancellor, and after the Jedi interrogated Dooku, Obi-Wan informed the Council about everything that happened on the Invisible Hand. The Palpatine-Anakin bond was weird to begin with. Anakin didn't want to kill Dooku, but Obi-Wan expressed that while he felt for Anakin, he was trying to resist Palpatine. Obi-Wan suggested to the Council that Anakin should not spy on the Chancellor. If they did in fact believe he was a Sith Lord, which the Collective Council believed, then it would be better for them if they kept Anakin as far away from Palpatine as possible. If he was allowed to go near him, then it could jeopardize everything. This notion was taken very seriously by the High Council. They didn't want to risk Anakin turning away from them. While they believed Anakin could be off kilter a lot of the time, and that he could be very difficult to work with other times, it wasn't worth the risk. They all liked him, they just didn't trust him. And they didn't want to trust him with someone who was actively trying to make him work against his own moral code. This drastically offended Windu as well. He was very pissed that Palpatine would just try and coerce Anakin into murdering Dooku like an executioner. Anakin was far better than that. Windu and Anakin may have not been as close as Palpatine and Anakin, but he didn't like that in the slightest. Why would a man who was so friendly with Anakin try and force him to do something he was so very clearly not okay with doing? The Council believed that there was one option. That option was to remove Palpatine from power. Yoda was on board with the idea. However, introducing it to Skywalker was a different story. The Council knew, in an instance like this, they cannot lie to him simply because he was on Coruscant and the Senate building was just across the way. Windu and the other Masters were convinced that they would be able to do this without it backfiring on them, as long as they provided the right information to Skywalker. They had to sway the conversation in the right direction to make sure Anakin didn't see this as anything other than protecting the Republic. Both Dooku and Grievous were out of the picture, and Palpatine, despite the chaos of the last few hours, wasn't scrambling to end the war. Something was off with that. When Anakin was inside the Council Chambers, they gave him the rank of Master. This wasn't as a means to garner favorability with him, it was actually requested by Master Kenobi. He suggested they do it because Anakin was following the Jedi Code, despite someone of a higher militaristic rank ordering him to do something he knew was wrong. It was the actions of a Jedi Master, not a Knight. The Council did agree with this, and because of this, they were able to try and get information out of Dooku, regardless of it working or not. 
If there was something involving Palpatine that Dooku knew about, it was better that he was alive rather than deceased. Anakin Skywalker was now a Jedi Master. He stood in the council chambers amongst his peers with great pride. He said he was extremely grateful for the responsibility, and as he was asked to take a seat, he took it. The council turned the conversation around and suggested they needed to make a move on the Senate. This did blindside Anakin, and he listened intently as both Yoda and Windu talked about why they were going to make a move on the Senate, and for how long they intended for it to last. It wasn't meant to take long. The Jedi wanted to remove Palpatine from power, which they were aware would cause a discrepancy with Anakin. But with Palpatine removed from power, they could force a peace treaty onto the Senate floor and request that the war come to an end. And that, the Senate elect a new Chancellor, one that didn't have his or her own intentions before anyone else in the Republic. Palpatine was corrupt, and his grip on the galaxy was too strong. The war needed to come to an end. Anakin was left in a state of bewilderment. He was going to counter it and suggest that it was illegitimate, and that they couldn't do it, but the Jedi had a long history of intervening in the Republic. This would obviously be further than anywhere they'd ever gone before. Anakin didn't agree with it, but he kind of saw their point. He also didn't want to lose the rank of Master, and figured he should accept the status quo. Not for nothing, ending the war was better than prolonging it. The Jedi were keepers of peace and justice. Obviously, aside from Padme, Anakin didn't have a whole lot of reasons to trust people in the Senate anyways. Yoda told Obi-Wan and Anakin that they would remain here inside the Jedi Temple, as the rest of the Council made their move on the Senate. When the session ended, Anakin tried to contact Padme so that she was aware that the Jedi were coming, but she didn't respond. He was kind of disgruntled with it, but it didn't matter, it wasn't that big of a deal. Obi-Wan was also busy keeping him distracted anyways. Anakin told his former master that doing this didn't seem right, and while Obi-Wan understood Anakin's sentiment, it was about doing what was right for the galaxy. That's what Jedi were supposed to do, even if no one liked him for doing it. That's what Anakin did on the Invisible Hand, and they should hope that this results in a betterment for the galaxy. Obi-Wan didn't want Anakin to put pressure on himself. He told Anakin that what he did was a testament to who he was as an individual and as a Jedi. Obi-Wan suggested that he was a great Jedi. He was a product of his own hard work and determination. And he was very proud of him. This did bring a smile to Anakin's face as the two of them walked through the halls, talking and communicating with each other. That is until a surge in the Force got their attention. Anakin and Obi-Wan looked at each other with a load of confusion. Something terrible was happening on Coruscant. The Jedi in the halls of the Jedi Temple were all confused, and they looked around at each other. The motion within the halls of the temple came to a complete stop, as they tried to understand what was causing this. Obi-Wan said the words before Anakin could. It was a Senate. When the Jedi Council arrived at the Senate building, they came with a number of clone troopers. Palpatine was prepared, and he intended on playing the long game here. Out of all the contingency orders, he of course had one that was meant to remove the entire Senate from existence. It was Executive Order 18. This order forced all clone troopers to turn against the Senate. This was an order that could be used by the Chancellor, and it didn't turn men against him. So, when the Jedi entered with a number of clone troopers, they were all given Executive Order 18. The clones switched into kill mode and tracked down each and every single Senator inside the Senate building and Republic Executive building and killed them all. Palpatine, on the other hand, barricaded himself inside of his office because of this siege on the Republic. The Jedi were so clearly trying to take over, and of course, the clones who were completely fine with following this order were as well. Of course, the downside is that Masameda was going to get canned, but he was replaceable, so it wasn't that big of a deal to Palpatine. Oh, and not for nothing, the entire Republic got to watch it. Every citizen saw the Jedi go in, and then reports came out that it was the Jedi who killed everyone. How could this not be Palpatine's plan? It was such a perfectly curated plan. Get a bunch of people riled up, send them to the Senate, and then blame them as he establishes himself as a monarch. It was brilliant, and it would see the fall of the Republic. Republic troopers and shock troopers were brought to the Senate building and Republic executive building to arrest the traitors. The Jedi were so confused when it started, and they quickly tried to stop the slaughter, but the clones couldn't be stopped. The tragedy is, there were simply just too many clones inside the Senate building to stop. They couldn't stop the tragedy from unfolding, and little did they realize that it looked like they planned for this to happen as such. They went there in a show of force, and now the entire Senate, aside from senators who were off-world, were dead. Anakin tried to rush over to the Senate, but Obi-Wan had to stop him. Obi-Wan told Anakin that everything would be alright, they just needed to let everything pan out. As it turns out, that was the right decision, because if they went there, they would cause even more ruckus. But everything panned out extremely negative for the Jedi. While the Separatists didn't have any leadership aside from the Cowardly Council and the government on Raxus, that no one listened to, the Republic was now leaderless. On the Senate grounds, a battle ensued, though it did not include the Jedi. The clones who had Order 18 were fighting with the shock troopers who came to stop this rebellion. Commander Fox and his men were trying to make the others surrender, but the clones with Order 18 could only see these clones acting as traitors of the Republic and traitors of the Chancellor. The Jedi had to skip town and lock down their temple. 
Tin, Kolar, Fisto, and the other council members returned to the Jedi Temple to lock it down, while Mace Windu and Yoda began their search for Palpatine. Regardless of him being the Sith Lord or not, he needed to be found inside of the temple Anakin told Obi-Wan that he had to go, and Obi-Wan told him that he wasn't going anywhere alone. He would be by his side through this. Anakin agreed begrudgingly, and the two of them left the Jedi Temple for Padme's residence. The Republic News was reporting that every senator inside of the Senate and Republic executive buildings were dead. No one was being kept as a prisoner, it was an all-out war, and they were being executed. Obi-Wan knew where Anakin was going, and he hoped that Padme would be there. Their ship piloted across the skies of Coruscant, ducking and weaving streams of vessels on their daily commute. Obi-Wan was getting nauseous from the maneuvers, but he was able to turn on his tracking device. As their ship sped through the skies, they ended up at Padme's residence, which is not exactly where Obi-Wan thought they were going. When they docked, Anakin hopped out of the ship and ran through the hallway searching for Padme. Obi-Wan got out of the ship as well. Something was wrong. What was it? He put his hand on his belt and looked around. Obi-Wan could feel his eyes met the gaze of the sinister smile. Obi-Wan said it aloud, calling Palpatine the Sith Lord. Palpatine emerged from the shadows of the apartment. Anakin came running back, hearing this. To see Obi-Wan standing across from Palpatine in the living room of the apartment, Anakin asked what was happening here. Palpatine turned with an outrageous look on his face. He called Anakin his boy and said he came here to make sure that Padme was okay. He had to escape the Senate building with the Jedi infiltration and whatnot. Anakin looked as he crept forward, asking what that was supposed to mean. So he smiled and told Anakin that the Jedi were trying to take over. All who have power seek to control it. The Jedi were simply trying to seize control over the Senate and the Republic for their own greed, and it put the lives of every senator in danger. Palpatine came here because he knew that she was in danger, and she wasn't responding to her communication device. Anakin looked infuriated. Obi-Wan had seen such anger in Skywalker so many times, but never to this degree. He put his hand up and told Anakin that it couldn't be remotely true. The Jedi didn't want to harm anyone, and he knew that. This action could only be made by the same man who tried to force him to break the code earlier. Anakin looked over at Obi-Wan. He was angry and emotional, his eyes welted with tears at the possibility of Padme being dead. Obi-Wan told Anakin that he had his back in all this, and so did the Jedi. They showed that to him today, didn't they? They supported him for his actions on the Invisible Hand, and they supported him as a Jedi. Anakin nodded his head, and said he could see his grip slipping. He reminded Anakin that the Jedi never had his best intentions in their mind. Just remember his mother. Anakin looked over with a seething rage and remembered how the Jedi didn't ever free her. Obi-Wan shook his head. He told Anakin that the Jedi didn't want that. They couldn't go out that far because of the Republic. Mind you, a Republic that was controlled by Palpatine at the time. If it mattered to him, then he would have done it. Anakin then asked why Obi-Wan didn't do it if it mattered to him. Obi-Wan told Anakin that he followed the code and the jurisdiction of the High Council. He pleaded with the Council members a number of times, and yet every time he did, they told him that the Chancellor was denying the request. Obi-Wan asked if he really thought he would just do that to him. At the same time, why would the Jedi realistically want every Senator dead? What would that do for them? What would that give them? They worked so closely with the Republic for centuries, and now all of a sudden just changed that? Didn't make any sense. At that, the Jedi put Anakin there to protect Padme three years before. If they wanted the Senators hurt, then why would they do that? Obi-Wan looked sincerely into Anakin's eyes and said, If it wasn't for the Jedi pairing him with Padme, they would have never shared their love for each other for such a short period of time. Obi-Wan understood. He was paired with someone at a young age they lost her to. Obi-Wan told Anakin that it took strength to resist the dark side. Only the weak embrace it, and Anakin was not weak. He was one of the strongest-willed people he'd ever met. Anakin frowned with a little smile as well. He looked at his master, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Cease's anger was growing, and he said that this was enough before igniting his lightsabers. Obi-Wan was waiting for it. He could see it in Palpatine's eyes and ignited his own lightsaber just in time. Cease sped forward, catching Obi-Wan in a bind. The Jedi Master of Defense had to protect himself. Anakin saw this and his rage split. He knew who had his intentions and good spirits and who was trying to manipulate him. His blade ignited and he sped towards Palpatine. He was already drifting towards Kenobi anyways because his points actually made sense, but now he was all against Palpatine. This meant that Palpatine intentionally killed his wife and tried to frame the Jedi, not to mention his child as well. Anakin's strikes were hot and heavy. Each time his blade connected, the force was magnificent. He was actively trying to kill. Obi-Wan was quick to use his defense as an ally as they got stuck in the gridlock with the Sith Lord. Sidious was on something else, his rage and his power unlike anything they'd ever seen before. Sidious used both of his lightsabers and broke away from Anakin before he kicked Obi-Wan in the face and attacked at full speed. Obi-Wan was quick, but not quick enough falling backwards and seeing a crimson lightsaber dive towards his face. Before it could connect, an amethyst blade slammed into the blade, deterring it from his path. The three collectively looked over at the Master of the Order, Mace Windu, as he arrived and pulled his lightsaber back into his hand. He told Sidious that this party was over. 
He lunged forward and Sidious backed up, moving away from Kenobi to defend himself. Skywalker moved in as well. Sidious was defending himself from both sides. His speed and ferocity were incredible, each strike landing his mark, each defense protecting him where it needed to be. Sidious moved with incredible speed, kicking Skywalker off the assault and singling out Windu as Kenobi came up and joined his Jedi brother. Sidious cackled, throwing his blades around, shoving and pushing the Jedi in every which way. Windu used Vapod against Sidious to take advantage of the dark side within. Obi-Wan got engaged, his lightsaber quickly defending each strike and parrying where it needed to be. He had his opportunity to strike, but he was too late. Sidious was far too quick. He intended for Obi-Wan to make the move, and it worked. Sidious slashed his blade down across Obi-Wan's thigh, and he dropped to the ground. Before a final blow could be dealt, Anakin saved his master with a defending strike before thrusting Palpatine's blade upwards. Sidious backpedaled before using some furniture to leap off of. As he landed, the furniture was thrown at the Jedi who defended themselves. Windu looked at Anakin with a nod as they cut through the furniture. Anakin and Windu moved shoulder to shoulder with each other. Windu moved his blade up and said for Skywalker to go now. Anakin ducked under a strike made by Sidious. Windu smashed his blade across Sidious' hand, which was a jarring strike that forced Sidious to lose his blade. As Windu moved forward, his side was slashed by the blade of Sidious as he fell over. Anakin used his momentum kicking Sidious in the stomach, which ironically because of Windu bending over in his pain, Sidious tripped over Windu. This left him undefended as Skywalker leapt up into the middle of the air, using all of his force and thrusting his saber downwards. Obi-Wan was watching and Sidious quickly lifted his other lightsaber. It would kill Anakin. Obi-Wan reached for his blade and flipped it across the room with as much speed as he possibly could. If he missed, Skywalker would die. As Anakin looked down preparing to end Sidious' life, his own flashed before his own eyes. The Crimson Blade was staring at him right in the eyes. Anakin closed his own. He saw the pod race, his mother, his friends from Tatooine, the Clone Wars beginning on Genosis. He could see Ahsoka, he could see Padme in the fields of Naboo. When his eyes opened, he caught his breath. He was stiff. He looked down, and he looked into the lifeless eyes of Palpatine. Both Windu and Obi-Wan called out Anakin's name. He looked down and saw the Crimson Blade rolling on the ground next to him before it extinguished itself, with smoke rolling out of it. Anakin's breath resumed, and he rolled over and looked up at the ceiling. Mace got up, and Obi-Wan did as well. Mace stood over Anakin and asked if he was alright. Anakin simply smiled a little bit before closing his eyes and nodding his head. He opened his eyes as Windu outstretched his arm and helped Anakin up. Anakin asked Master Windu if he was able to give peace to everyone who died because of Sidious. Mace smiled and placed his hand on Anakin's shoulder and nodded his head. He told Anakin that he didn't just give those people their peace, he saved an entire galaxy from more pain and Mace paused for a moment as he looked on with pride at Anakin. And he brought balance of the force. Anakin's smile faded and a tear watered in his eyes. He thanked Master Windu and Mace told him that he was the one who did it. He was the chosen one. Obi-Wan hobbled over to the two of them and he put his hand on Anakin's upper back and told him that those who he lost would be very proud of him. Obviously both Anakin and Obi-Wan knew who he was talking about, but it was the final straw for Anakin. A tear slipped down his cheek and he thanked both of them. He told them that he couldn't have done it without them. The three Jedi would request for a number of temple guards to come and pick up the body of Sidious. They had to dispose of it the Jedi way, and as they did with Sith bodies. It was respectful in its own right, but the Jedi would purge the body of anything resembling the dark side and then give them a proper burial. The belief is that the dark side corrupted what would have otherwise been a fine individual. Someone of Palpatine's intellect would have made a great Jedi. Mace told Master Skywalker that he should remain in the temple for now. The Council would clean up Palpatine's mess. As the Council prepared to inform the wider galaxy of the plot they learned about, Obi-Wan and Anakin would be sitting in the Council chambers in a fiery sunset. They were sitting there quietly. While the war was over with the Separatist government calling for peace, after seeing what the clones did to their own government, Obi-Wan and Anakin could feel the darkness still. Ahsoka was en route from Mandalore with Maul in custody. Anakin asked Obi-Wan why he could still feel such darkness. Obi-Wan told his former student that the dark side would never go away. It was always there. As long as people can make wrong decisions, there will always be a darkness. But what they do as Jedi determine how great that darkness can become. Perhaps the Jedi were too lenient for too long, and maybe the Clone Wars was what the Jedi needed to see that they just had fallen from their grace. Obi-Wan reminded Anakin that the war was fresh. The light would return, but it would take its time to happen. Obi-Wan then begged the question. He told Anakin he knew that they weren't supposed to talk about it. Obviously they weren't. But how was he doing in regards to the loss of Padme? Anakin looked over, out across the city. He could see the collection of structures where Padme's residence was. Anakin looked back over and told Obi-Wan that it hurt. A lot. His voice cracked when the words squeezed out. He told Obi-Wan that he wasn't ready to let go of someone he loved so much. How could he? Anakin said he was afraid of getting too close to people. He lost everyone he was close to. Obi-Wan shook his head. 
suggesting that if he was restricting himself, he would lose himself. That wouldn't be what his mother or Padme wanted for him. Anakin nodded his head, afraid to speak under such conditions that he felt over himself. Obi-Wan could tell, and he looked off in the distance too. He told Anakin that he harbored a lot of feelings for Satine. Perhaps they could say they loved each other. Obi-Wan told Anakin that he watched her die before his eyes. She died in his arms. But it was for her that he never changed. He couldn't change himself because of her death. She wouldn't want that for him and neither would Qui-Gon. If he became someone he wasn't, he'd be doing a disservice to himself and those he cared about. If Anakin wanted to stay a strong individual, he'd find peace in the destruction. He wouldn't resent those around him for something they had no control over. He would trust that what happened was out of his control and that those he loved knew he did everything he could for them in the end. Anakin's cheeks were flowing with tears as he wiped them away with his metallic glove. Obi-Wan reminded Anakin that he was who he was because of those people. To never remove himself from within or it would tarnish everything they loved about him. Anakin smiled and thanked Obi-Wan for his kind words. Obi-Wan just smiled and closed his eyes. He heard Satine tell him through his memories that she loved him, that she always would. A tear slipped down his own cheek and he told his former student that the words were true, everything about them and him were true. The two of them would sit with each other in a solitary state of peace and mourning. When Ahsoka returned to the temple, they would greet her, and Sinjalak would take Maul off at their hands. That was it. The end of the Sith. Dooku, Maul, Sidious, their religion was gone. Anakin excitedly asked Ahsoka if she would reconsider joining the Jedi Order. She looked a little mad about the idea, but Anakin did give a tempting offer. Now that he was a council member and a master, he could make legitimate cases to the Jedi Council to change things. She kind of smiled and said she'd think about it. Obi-Wan just smiled and told her that they were proud of her. She did them a great service, one for the galaxy and one for the Jedi. She nodded her head. Over the coming weeks, the Jedi would work as an interim government. They would completely take control over the Republic and explain away everything they discovered. Without a Senate or Chancellor sitting in their way, they would reveal everything regarding the clone army and the facilities on Kamino. This would have the Kaminoans being arrested by clone troopers for the fabrication of a war and the plot to take over the Republic and destroy the Jedi. At the same time, while it wasn't encouraged by the Jedi, the former CIS government, which was working closely with the Jedi, would outvote the Jedi in a decision that would have the entire Separatist Council publicly executed for costing the lives of millions. This council was Newt Dunray's council, not their actual government. The Jedi would open up the Senate, and people from around the galaxy would begin their elections, and slowly but surely, the Republic would fill up. It was at this point where the council needed to make a decision control the Republic, or let go. Yoda believed that they needed to take more of a role in the government, but Anakin and a number of other Jedi suggested that to do that could allow another situation similar to the previous one to happen again. The Jedi were too far into the Republic to see what was wrong with it. Sure, Dooku was wrong for many things, but this particular thing did actually have some legitimacy to it. The Jedi would decide that being a part of the Republic so tightly wasn't the best idea, and that perhaps they should try and remove themselves. This idea was taken and voted upon. They would leave the Republic. However, before they left, they had to ensure no one could receive so much power again. Ahsoka would see the distance created between the Jedi and the Republic, and see it as a large enough change to switch teams and rejoin the ranks of the Jedi Order. However, that did include something else. While the Clone Wars were over, the galaxy learned of Crimson Dawn, and the Jedi weren't about to let them or other criminal empires grow to the size of the Nile. The Nile were so large that they kept the Republic away from the Outer Rim for centuries during the era of the High Republic. Yoda and Opa Rancisis, remembering those days, did not want it to happen again. Since they had an army, why not use it? Oh, Skywalker loved this. He could kill the Huts. Maybe it wasn't the most Jedi thing ever, but he could enjoy every second of their painful deaths. He wanted them to remember his face when he was cutting them down. This, of course, didn't need to be shared with anybody else, and it wasn't. The Republic dove right into the Outer Rim. If anyone thought funding was a concern, it wasn't. The Republic took everything from the Kaminoan Reserve, everything from Dooku's estate, and just about everything the Separatist government had to offer. The irony is, the battle droids for the Separatists were reprogrammed and sent to die for the Republic. Of course, if there were clones that wanted or were interested in joining, they couldn't. And they did. However, the Republic was very adamant on taking care of the clone troopers who fought a war and were bred to fight a war for the purpose of dying so that one man could have all the power in the galaxy. Of course, for the most part, the rest of the reserve were split up and used across the galaxy. For the battlefront, it didn't take more than a year for Jedi, droids, and clones to defeat the pirates. Once they were gone, the Republic reinstated the Starlight Beacon Project to establish stations, or as they called them, Beacons of Hope, across the Outer Rim to show that the Republic was here and that they were here to help. The Clone Wars took a lot from the people of the galaxy, but his resolution would give everything back plus some. 
Skywalker's time as a Jedi would remain permanent, and while he was devastated from the losses he endured, he made a promise to himself to be sure that he helped others in the Order, and as a member of the High Council, that he took on the responsibility of another Jedi Padawan, and a young Twi'lek girl named Deja Numa. Ahsoka, on the other hand, would avoid teaching and spend a collection of time as a knight at with the other Jedi on several missions. She was treated in high regard by the Jedi Council, not because she was Anakin's former student, but because she was her. She defeated Maul and went through some of the most arduous trials one could go through. She was an equal in their eyes to most Jedi Masters. There was an issue with one of the Temple Guards during this year since Palpatine's death, but the man who was soon to be Grand Inquisitor was locked away and given a peaceful death with Dooku. The deaths weren't painful and it was just a means to, you know, let them have their peace, rather than be consumed by hatred. Maul, on the other hand, despite all of his hate, could be saved. Grand Inquisitor was too new to the concept to have any real reason to go back on it, and Dooku was shortly removed from death anyways, so, you know, why not? While there was a grudge between Maul and Kenobi, mostly for Maul, he was willing to give it a try, and try he didn't. Plo Koon and Kid Fisto led the work on Maul, and it ended up, after years of dedication, bringing him to become a Jedi. He would train under Plo Koon until he was able to become a Jedi Knight. Ahsoka eventually, like her master, would take on a student and become a Jedi Master herself. While the galaxy was far from perfect, and there were issues, especially in the Outer Rim, it was a much better galaxy. One with unity, compassion, care, and love for all who existed within it. And that, my friends, is our story. Again, special thanks to Galvin Gaming, Tristan, Darth Revan, Pimp Daddy Bane, Wee Woo 670, The Last Jedi, Apollo, The Eternal Padawan, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Mad Mad Studios, Anakin 003, Fordo's Legacy Star Wars, Lemon Knight, Rex the Wolf, Man with Three First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. Smash the like button if you want to support me in other ways. Go check out the Patreon. You can find out tons of cool things before they come out. For the lightsaber giveaway, go down below and click the link and sign up. Go and get yourself ready. 90,000 subscribers is right around the corner. Let's go! Otherwise, let's talk about our story. Obviously, the first thing I want to get out of the way is the Execute Order 18. That isn't like a real contingency order, but I made it up for the purpose of the video to have something unique happen. Uh, the 18, if you want to know where that comes from, that is 2187, that is Finn's number or the cell number for Leia's cell in A New Hope. That's just 2118 added up together, so Execute Order 18 is just 2187. Aside from that, this is like really fun. There are so many Revenge of the Sith videos that it's so hard to stand out, and I think this one accomplishes that. I think this one kind of sits in its own realm with the Senate being destroyed, uh, but also Anakin not going dark side and allowing him to to really have a mature character development in this story. And I like like I think that if the original trilogy didn't exist, this is probably around the lines of what could happen in a prequel trilogy without an original trilogy or something like that. Where like you have Anakin have this this teetering between light and dark, but he keeps finding a way to get out of it and allowing himself to move forward. And while yes, it's a travesty that Padme, Luke, and Leia die, it is for the betterment of the galaxy in some way you know obviously the senate gets wiped out but the senate gets completely replaced so the corruption is completely removed from it and the jedi can just make it impossible for another emperor to rise so anyways i hope you all enjoyed this this was a cool video different in its own way while being revenge of the sith video i love you all spread the love and always remember my friends may the force be with you